While you're eating, here's what I want to talk about because I want to make sure we stay on schedule and give you time for the things that, that we want you to learn today and have a chance to discover today. Um, so one of the things that one of the things that we believe is highly important for you is as you develop your, your ministry in your context, is having some tools to help you understand even more of what the community is that you live in. Okay? And why do we do that? There's some scriptural uh, references to that, right? In um, Matthew 22, it says, Jesus was asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. <coughs> to love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And I already know that many of your, you in this group, many churches in this room, are already loving on their neighbor well. And so when we move into your coaching groups, I want you to share a couple of those ways that you're already loving on your neighbor. Okay? But sometimes we don't know who our neighbor is, and so we're going to talk about some tools that we've given you to help you understand demographically who some of your neighbors may be or are in the place where your church is actually located. Because here's what I know about most churches and about most of who we are, because this is just the way that we've become over time. We're really good at building community inside the building, but we're often very not connected to the community outside our building. Okay? And so, but what we're called to do is not just love the neighbors that are sitting next to us on the pew. That's not what that scripture was about. We're called to love the neighbors who are not yet there. Right? And so the other thing that we know is that this scripture, that the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. And we saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. And so, Jesus became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. And, and Jesus is there. And sometimes we can become very uh, inwardly focused that we don't always discover where Jesus is in the community already. And so inside the church, we can make assumptions that Jesus isn't out there. But, as we heard earlier, even when we, when we don't feel like Jesus is with us, Jesus is there, right? And so our call is to help make Jesus known. Our call is to sometimes is to help make Jesus known to the very people that are sitting in the pews with us already because we can become very focused on the things that are not happening or the way that we want them to happen. But we also have to be about making Jesus known in the community where we're planning. And then the last part, that I, and I love this scripture, and our church is focused on this in the way that we interact with missions, is this is from Acts 4.8. And it says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what we have to think about when we're talking about this scripture is that while this was said to those <coughs> disciples that were there with Jesus before he ascended, we have our own Jerusalem. We have our own Judea, our own Samaria. And the ends of the earth is anywhere in the world, right? And so your Jerusalem, I heard you defined yesterday in a, in a video that I watched on Thursday, and it's the way that our church has embraced this, Jerusalem. It's the people and the places that we already are familiar with. Okay? For Jerusalem is the place where the people are usually just like ourselves. They have to welcome us in because we look like them, we act like them, we talk like them, even if they don't like us sometimes. Okay? And so Jerusalem is that home base, that space. 
Judea is a broader space of that. So, to give you an example, if, the, if Jerusalem were the Tennessee Conference, then the southeastern jurisdiction, which we're part of with 14 other conferences, is Judea. It's a broader space, okay? All the cultures are not the same necessarily in those different places. The people are not the same and so on. But we're, that can be our Judea. I heard it also said another way that for some of us, Judea are young adults or children or youth because we don't know how to communicate with them. Even though they live in our same uh, Jerusalem in our same space, we've lost the ability to communicate with them. And so we have to have people be interpreters for us sometimes. Okay? Right now, I'm trying to teach, help teach my 16-year-old daughter how to drive a car. And sometimes it feels like we're not speaking the same language. Or uh, most of the time, I'm going to die when I'm in that right seat. And there are no controls. There needs to be an optional vehicle you can rent. Or you can't you drive in Okay? Or my 14-year-old son, who has hit puberty, and beyond it now, and for whatever reason, this sweet kid that used to want to talk to us and be around us, now thinks we're the plague and it's contagious and so he doesn't come around. So we need an interpreter for that in our own house. So that could be our Judea possibly. And then that's Samaria. Samaria is that place where people, you avoided it. You know, as the speaker said the other day, it's that neighborhood you drive through and you know you better lock the doors because you just know everybody locks their doors there. It's the, it's the places that you avoid. It's the, it's the people that you see on, the, on one side of the street that come, you say, I've got to go to the other side of the street. But the reality is, we don't have to go to actual Samaria that Jesus talked about there, or Judea, or Jerusalem. We have those characteristics in the spaces that we're already in. Okay, so, so what I've given you uh, on your table is a document, and it's just a condensed version of a much broader document that you can have access to. Uh, your pastor uh, may have training in it, may know it. Our office has the ability to show you how to do it. Once you get a log on, it's really um, somewhat easy to get the reports that we found. Okay, at least and maybe that's me and my uh, technology driven space. So what you have in front of you, um, you have the full quick insight report. It's about, it's stapled, and there's, a, there's 11 pages front and back to that. Um, and then I just asked Julie, um, I tend to be free, a free flow thinker, so I'll, I'll think something, say, hey, Julie, can you do this? And then 20 minutes later, it's like, oh, I need her to do this. So that's why you have to, you have a part of it right there. Uh, and it's just got these different colored lines on it. Uh, it's, uh, it looks like this, okay? It looks like this. So I want to just, I want you to pull that out real quick because there should be enough for your team there to look at. And it's inside that bigger report. So what this Mission Insight report does is it looks at um, census data. It looks at uh, the, your entire community. And what I did was I put in the address of your church building that I had either through UM Church Finder or what you gave us or so on and on Google, and I did a five mile radius around that address. And so this is census data, demographics, uh, Experian, any of those uh, companies that do data research on people, okay? And some are done to uh, ask specific questions and so on. And there are 10 factors that they looked at in this report, and, and you'll see them uh, at the top of that front page, if, you, if you've got it right there, um, is it? Right there, that, and we're going to talk about that front page right there. Okay, got the 10 factors. The first factor is population change. How has your population change uh, in, a, in the time frame? I think it's uh, 10 years. So what's your 10 year population change pattern? Okay, so it's going to move from uh, somewhat, uh, so it's going to look like, look at from left to right. Um, Significant decline, moderate decline, little change, moderate growth, significant growth. 
You see that on your on your chart? It's this tin list right here. Okay, you might have to share with somebody at your table. All right, then the second one is school age change. How has the change or the population of your school age children changed in this 10 year area, 10 year time frame more expected to change? Okay? Again, significant from decline to significant increase. Families with children, what does that look like over that 10 year period? Okay? Adult education attainment is another factor that they look at. Community diversity in index. All right, and that's over a 10 year, uh, over that cycle, but now that's over actually looking at that cycle and that space. So very homogeneous, meaning all of one uh, ethnicity to extremely diverse of multi-ethnicities, okay? So for example, this one that I'm looking at is moderately diverse. And this Smyrna first, in this community. Medium family income is the next factor. How does it compare to the state rate for this area? Okay? Poverty is also based upon the state numbers. And it ranges from significantly low, meaning that if, if poverty level uh, was a 10, if that's the baseline, and it's significantly below, below that means that you're not as impoverished as the, as the baseline middle. And if it's significantly above, that means you're a higher impoverished area than the middle, the average, okay? Then comparative occupations, blue-collar jobs to white-collar occupations, okay? Then what is the largest racial or ethnic group? And then this last factor that's on there is religiosity. What is the level of religiosity in your, in, in your study area? And religiosity is somewhat defined as how receptive are they to be engaged in religious practices or religious beliefs, okay? So for example, this one says somewhat low, meaning that there is somewhat low. And on the back of the, um, let me see your, your 10 page one. We looked at this in a meeting I was in the other day, and on page 10 of the full report that I gave you, the state of Tennessee's uh, religiosity uh, factor, conservative evangelical Christians make up 37%, consider myself a spiritual person 43%, enjoy watching religious TV programs 18%, important to attend a religious service, 18%. My faith is really important to me, 16%. So that's the state, this 16%, okay? And I think we can make assumptions thinking that we're in the Bible Belt, as people call us, and there's churches on every corner, that that number would be significantly higher because of where we're located. But the reality is, 16% of folks say that religion is somewhat important to me. Okay. Now, also inside your uh, document, there is a population change graph on the back of this one. Okay, and it talks about how your population is in, in households and families and so on are going to change, uh, projected to change over that 10-year cycle from 2000. Actually, it, it, comparatively, from 2000 to 2027 is what they're they're estimating now. But inside this 11-page document, um, on page, and, and you can look at it yourself when you get a chance here in just a second, um, on page 5 of your full report, you will see it broken down by ages, by 0 to 4, by 5 to 17, by 18 to 24, and so on. It will show you what they estimate your population numbers to look like in those specific age categories. And that's important for us to look at because sometimes what we can we can do is that we can tend to think that um, because we don't see any children or youth or young adults in our building, that there aren't any in our community. But there isn't a single one of these reports that I looked at where that number said zero. 
on any of those lines. Okay? And it's sort of like, um, I never saw very many Ford Flexes. I drive a Ford Flex. It looks like a Hershey. You guys can see it sitting out there. But I never saw any Ford Flexes really at all. And I thought it was just a unique vehicle until I saw it on the CarMax lot and I drove it and I started driving it and I bought it. And then I started driving around and I was like, that guy's got a Ford Flex. That guy's got a Ford Flex. And then I started seeing some. Mine's got a white top and a red body. And we call it Victor Oladipo for Indiana's base basketball player and so on. And so it's like, I'm the only one with this vehicle? And I started seeing one here, one there, one there. And so if we're not looking for it, if it's not on our radar, we tend to not look for it, right? And so I hope by having this tool, and some of you may have already used these tools, that's great. But so by, by having this tool, I hope that it will start opening you maybe recognize, because as, as Stephanie said, numbers matter, okay? Because they're people. And once you start tracking those people, once you start taking attendance and knowing who they are and knowing their name and, and keeping data and so on, you will start to see them more because you'll start to see them more, okay? Is, is they become more aware of you. And you, they'll become more aware when they're not there. And so you create processes and procedures to make sure that you're connecting with them about why they're not there. So here's what I want us to do. Um, I want us to take just a few minutes at the table, um, and I want you to spend some time examining the data that you have on your reports together. All right? Pick out a thing, share it, talk about it, and, and, uh, and, and what we're going to do then after you spend some time in here, and after you people finish eating, uh, this wonderful dessert and so on. Then we're going to, I'm going to send you out into specific rooms with just your coaching group. And in your coaching group, uh, I'm going to, you're going to do some work in there together as a group of churches to talk about this data. Okay? So, so go ahead and start talking about the reports that you have in front of you. With your partner. What stuck out to you? What surprised you? What did you realize that you didn't think about before? Wow, I didn't know.
done, eh? <laughs> Thank you. 